Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ and family and friends. Today, let's talk about Matthew chapter 3. We're continuing on our study in Matthew. We've already done Matthew chapter 1 and 2, and now we're on to 3. And the title of this lesson is going to be called The Upside Down Kingdom. To get us started off, I'd like to tell you a story about a show I was watching the other day. Um, I was watching this show called Lone Star Law, and one of the officers, he pulled over this guy in the dark, and, uh, and he comes out and he finds that this guy, he's just not quite acting right. And, and he suspects the guy's on some sort of drugs. And he gets the guy out of the car and he asks him, is there any drugs or anything that I might find in the vehicle? And do you mind if I search the vehicle? The man tells him, he goes, yes, I, I do have some drugs. I, I have some, um, it's by my center console area. And then the cop goes in there, he's searching around. And, uh, and guess what? He goes, the cop asks, he says, is it under your Bible? The drugs, is, it's under, is it under your Bible? <laughs> and the guy says, yeah, it's, it's under my Bible. And so the cop lifts it up, and sure enough, that's where he found some meth that the guy was taking. And it's pretty interesting here because you would think that this would be a bad case for Christians. And you'd say, oh, all Christians are just a bunch of meth heads and crackheads and, and all these people doing horrible things. But guess what? This is the, these are the kind of people that God desires, believe it or not. He wants the people that really desire him, the people that need him uh, more than anybody else. And I'm convinced that that's why a lot of times in these third world countries, why Christianity can spread like wildfire. Those people, they desire the spirit of the word 10 times more than we do in the U.S. In those countries, they, it's, it's almost like that's just absolute food to them. They can't do without that food. And this is the upside down kingdom where the people that are like that guy, those drug addicts, those people that are trying to make their life right. I don't know if that guy was trying to make his life right, but say we'll, we'll be optimistic about it. Say if he was the one who's trying to make his life right, those people are like those low valleys that can be made up into mountains. If they're doing all the right spiritual things, all those things to desire Christ in the end, they can make it into heaven and they can be living in a mansion um, in heaven in the most beautiful place that you could possibly imagine. And this is God's promise to us. But in those kings on this earthly um, on this earthly planet, when they die, if they weren't following Christ, somebody with all this riches, these presidents, these rulers, um, the top people in the land, the, the billionaires, if they're not following Christ, they might have this that this beautiful um, these beautiful riches to take care of them in this world. But in the very end, they'll be like those valleys. Those mountains will be like valleys, and the valleys will be made into mountains. And this is the upside-down kingdom. And uh, a perfect example of this upside-down kingdom is actually John the Baptist, who is uh, one of the main characters in our lesson today. And he was a guy that was wearing, uh, he, had, he had a raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. This is no guy who's just walking about with a bunch of money and said, oh, I'll buy a, I'll buy a steak off here and I'll, um, I'd like to buy this house and this. This is a guy who's going out there to spread God's word and he's wearing, a, he's wearing some very peculiar clothing. Um, this was not a very wealthy man, uh, surely, that was going about. And, uh, and something I wanted to mention about his, about his clothing here is it says that he had a leather girdle. And so if I was wearing a leather belt right now, I don't think that's exactly what it looked like back then. I imagine it was probably something like a shoulder strap. I suppose it could have been around the waist. Um, but it also, this, this word girdle, it means a belt and it means a pouch. <laughs> and it's funny, when I, when I looked at that translation in the Greek, in the, um, in the Greek interlinear, it's when it said a pouch and a belt, I'm like, that sounds to me like a fanny pack. <laughs> So actually, I thought about when I was preaching this lesson a, a week ago, I thought about um, wearing a fanny pack to my lesson and be like, hey, look at this. I'm wearing my girdle. Um, and so that's kind of what it reminds me of here. And so this is John the Baptist, a very peculiar man. For some reason, I just imagine that he just has a big scraggly beard. Um, just yesterday, I did have a big scraggly beard and I finally trimmed up. If you see my other videos, you'll see me with that big scraggly beard. And uh this is John the Baptist, a very peculiar character. I imagine he was, uh, people viewed him as somebody who was very eccentric. Let's read um, Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, before hopping into our verse, into our chapter. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so it's saying that John the Baptist, it says, did you catch that? Um, there is nobody that is greater than him 
in the kingdom of heaven. It says he's, it, it also says, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. This was a very, very righteous and special man. He was righteous in the sight of God. He was a very peculiar guy. And another thing I wanted to note here is a little bit more history about John the Baptist is that he was the son of Zacharias. He was a priest. He came from a priestly line of, of individuals. And uh, in fact, Zacharias' father had married Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was one of uh, the daughters of Aaron. And so if you remember back going down into Leviticus, this was Aaron was the high priest at that time. And his sons were the priests. So he came from this priestly line uh, he was not just some random guy that came crawling out of the woods eating locusts. All right, let's look at verse 1 of our chapter. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what's interesting here is if you break down the word Baptist, um, it comes from the word, uh, let's see if I can pronounce it right, Baptistes, and this means a baptizer. It's a very straightforward um very, very straightforward translation. It means a baptizer. In verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophets, Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And so this is speaking about a prophecy, and it's in a reference to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. It's talking about John the Baptist here, who's making, he's preparing this path to the Lord. He's making a highway for the Lord, a path for people to find the true Messiah, which is Jesus. Let's go ahead and read that. Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that's what I was talking about. He is making a highway, a path. He is preparing the way. I know I was watching a, um, a sermon on this. I believe it, I can't recall the exact YouTuber, um, or I think it's actually kind of more of an animation picture, uh, picture sermon. But they called John the Baptist a supporting character. And I remember in the comments, people were like, he is not a supporting character. Because when we think of that phrase, supporting character, we're thinking of an actor, somebody who just supports the main actors. Uh, but in this case, he really was a supporting character. Not in the traditional sense, but he was somebody that was supporting the way up to Christ. And in fact, he was not just any normal uh, normal supporter or, have, or having a supporting role. It said that he was, there was born no of no woman, a man greater. So this was a very special supporter leading up to Christ. And in, uh, in, in some senses, all men, all mankind, even those with very few sins, their righteousness, their self-righteousness, it's just like filthy rags compared to Jesus's righteousness. So he really is, uh, a, has a supporting role leading up to Christ. Okay. And so he's making, uh, he's making this path. And it's interesting here because many of the Jews, they were expecting a physical king. But that wasn't the kingdom that Jesus was going to bring about. Uh, when we think about this uh, upside down kingdom, the reason I mention it's upside down is you think of, when you think of a king, you think of a guy that has a staff and he has a crown and a purple robe and something that's glorious. But Jesus, he didn't go about like this. He came in the, with the utmost humility, and he was actually preaching of the coming of his kingdom that would not be of this world. Uh, John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. And so what he's getting at here is he's saying, If I was of this world, then all my disciples, when they, when this, when the, uh, all the Jews came down to go and to have him crucified and deliver him to Pilate, uh, they would, have, they would have, they would have decided, no, we're not going to let Jesus come. In fact, Peter, he didn't want Jesus to come so badly that he tried to, uh, he, he tried to, um, to take the head off one of the men that was coming to get Jesus. And in fact, the guy, likely, I think he, he turned his head and it cut his ear off, and Jesus grew that ear back on that guy, and. Um, and so, but Jesus had rebuked Peter and said, this must happen. I must go to be crucified and I must go to these people. He was not a typical king here. He spoke of his kingdom, this heavenly kingdom. And, uh, and, and a couple more things about this uh, upside down kingdom is that a typical king, they desired to con the conquest of land, uh, wealth and money. But for Jesus, he desired the conquest of souls, love and forgiveness. 
He desired the exact opposite of what many of these kingdoms have um, in, of, the, of the world and of the biblical times of those kingdoms that desired power and money. And uh, it's that's the kind of uh, Christ that Jesus was. And um, another one is that kings tend to be hateful. They tend, tend to be despite, despiteful users of mankind. Um, but Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So Jesus had the exact opposite approach. This is how he was going to gain all of his followers, through love and kindness. And, 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 and just to, beyond anything else, the utmost sign of love is that somebody can despitefully use you, they can hate you, they can spit on you, they can do the worst things possible to you. But as Christians, we must follow Jesus' Jesus's example here, and we must love them back. We must love them. I can't imagine the, the amount of love that that requires. I, 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 that's, I think that's something that's the fleshly side of me finds this as something that's very difficult. Something to, to love your enemies. When somebody is rude to me or does something that, that is uh, disruptful to my life, and I'm supposed to pray for them and love them back. That is the example that Jesus gave. Um, it's a very difficult path sometimes to follow, but this is the path that Jesus desires of a Christian. Another one is that a, um, a typical king will desire glory and pride, but in James chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So through humility and love, we can be like those valleys that are raised up into a mountain. And those mountains that do not show that love and do not show that humility, they will be cast into utter darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they did not follow the Messiah. They did not follow Jesus. And those people that did have that, those pleasures on this earth for a season will now be made low like those low, low valleys. Okay, another one. Uh, let's go to verse 5, actually. I'm going to skip that next one. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. And so actually I'm still in Isaiah here, um, Isaiah chapter, I believe it's 40, Verses, that was three verses, um, that was verses five through seven. Isaiah chapter uh, 40, verses five through seven, I just read there. And it mentions here that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. All these things in the world, including us, will eventually fade away. Um, granted that um, Christ could come today, he could come the next minute, he couldn't come in the next second um, to come and get us. But, um, that's what it's saying here. This world, all of us, everything that you see around you is ephemeral. It will pass away. And we need to treat it as such. We need to be putting our investment in those things that are eternal, those things that will last forever. Um, one of my favorite lessons, I've seen it used many times even in other lessons locally, is that somebody will take a piece of rope and they'll show the tiny little piece of that rope and they'll say, this is like this life. And the rest of this rope, and they'll pull out the entire rope and keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And they said, and I keep pulling on this, but that rope extends for infinity. And that is what we're, where we'll spend the rest of our life after we pass away from this earth. Whether we go to hell or heaven, we will spend eternity in that location. There is no between. The Bible only says that there is a hell or a heaven. You're either going to go one or the other. And this is not to try to scare you. This is trying to encourage you to choose the right path. Choose the, the path of love, of those things that, uh, that Christ desires. So if we love God, we will do his commandments and we'll do those things and put our investments in those things that are, uh, that are holy. And then verse 8 of, that, of Isaiah says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. That long piece of that rope that extends for, for infinity, that will last forever. Let's put our investment there. Let's put our treasures up in heaven. Verse 4. And this is of our chapter. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. And his meat was locusts and wild honey. It's interesting here. I want to make a, a, one more point. I, I know I mentioned a little bit about the girdle being a belt or a pocket. I also want to mention something about this locust. Uh, in fact, in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 22, it says, 
even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. So what it's saying here is that locusts were a permitted food to the Levitical priesthood. These were a food that was acceptable in the sight of the Lord. This is very odd to us because um, I don't know where you're uh, watching this from. Maybe if you're from another country that you're watching this from. But in the U.S., in Texas, <laughs> we don't eat locusts. You are very eccentric. You are very odd if you're somebody who's eating locusts. But back then, that was something that they went out of their way to say was permitted. So it must not have been as odd to them to eat locusts as it is to us. Um, in, in many countries, bugs are on the menu. But for us, it's not really on the menu. Um, it's not a criticism or anything else other than that. But it's just the fact that it's a cultural thing that back then it seemed to be more of a culturally accepted idea. Verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so I want you to imagine something. I want you to picture something in your head. I want you to imagine that John is going about, and he's baptizing individuals all around him, um, and he's just going about baptizing and baptizing and baptizing, and he's paving that pathway, that highway to Christ. And these Pharisees and the Sadducees, these were people, these were Jews that were viewed as the Holy of Holies. These were people that, that looked on the outside as something that was very, very pure. And they wanted everybody to see that, that they were very, very pure. But the problem was, they may have been externally pure and, and, and viewed as doing all the right works and the acts that would be pleasing in the sight of man. They were men pleasers. But the thing is, their hearts were corrupt. Their hearts were not desiring those things that are of God. They did not purely love God the way that they ought to. And that's something I want you to think about in your own life. Do you really love God? Do you really love him? Are you doing those things on the outside for, man, uh, for mankind to see and to think that you are special? And to think that you're beautiful and wonderful. Um, for example, um, here's a perfect example. If you said, say if you had a million dollars and you said, I'm going to um, donate 100,000 of this to, uh, to the poor. But while you did it, you said, hey, everybody, I'm going to put in the newspaper. I'm going to make sure that it is so public that I'm giving away this $100,000 that I can be viewed as a saint to mankind. The problem is you should have just done that in private. You should have just done that because that was something that would please God and you should have done it in the honor of God. But instead, you did it because that would, um, that would be pleasing to mankind. And so John, he's calling these people that were viewed as something very righteous. He calls them, O generation of vipers, and who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he is, he's calling them vipers. He's calling them something that is poisonous, something that can kill you. He's something, something that is toxic. And, uh, for example, Acts chapter 23, verse 8, it mentions a little bit more about the Sadducees here. It says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So it says a little bit about these people. Um, one way that I remember it is that the Sadducees, I think it's very sad, get it? Sad that they're, they do not believe in, the, in a resurrection. They do not think that Jesus arose from the dead. They do not think that we will rise from the dead. They don't also don't think that there's any angels, and they also don't think that there's any spirits. And if you don't believe in the spirit, you also don't believe there is a Holy Spirit, which is one of the parts of the Trinity, and you are denying Christ. You are committing the worst sin possible to deny God um, in front of your peers and in front of others in a public manner. And so that is not good. So these are the people that are coming to them, people that are are doing those things that are wicked in their hearts. Verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. So John the Baptist is really getting to the meat of the matter here. He's saying, if you're going to come forward to be baptized, you should be doing this for repentance, for doing it for the right reasons, to turn away from your sin, and to be focusing towards and looking forward to Christ. And that's what John the Baptist's baptism was all about. It was looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It was looking forward to that action. It had not happened yet, but they were doing the best that they could. And I believe it's uh, John chapter 18, verse 36. It hints at, it talks about how the Old Testament is just a shadow of the things to come. They were just doing the best that they could. They didn't have the perfect baptism that we have today. They were simply just doing it the best they can. Okay, verse 9. 
And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our fathers. Oh, one more thing I want to mention about that is that they are looking forward to the Messiah uh, with their baptism. And for us, we are looking back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can see that combination of how we approach baptism right there. Verse 9, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So he's telling them there that they're depending on their lineage. They are depending and saying, You know, I'm of the lineage of Abraham. I'm a Jew. I am something that is very special. And John is telling them, he says, that God is able of these stones. See, if there's stones over there, he's saying God could take those stones, something that is inanimate, and he can raise those things up into children unto Abraham. He can graft them in. And, uh, and, that, and that's the thing, is when we are baptized, it says that we put on Christ. And that's talking about today. That's talking about in the New Testament. When we put on Christ, when we are baptized, we are renewed. And, um, and I also want to make a, a quick little note about this. I was watching actually, a, and I, I didn't plan to say this, but um, there was a, a documentary I was watching about Spurgeon. He's a, he's a very, very popular commentator, but he does not believe in, uh, in baptismal regeneration. That concept that when you're baptized, you are regenerated. You are born again, which is a necessary action that Spurgeon agrees. We have to be baptized. And so um, the fact that we do... Um, and that is the way that the Bible has told us the way that we are born again. It is through baptism. We are, uh, that is the way that we can um, put away the sins of the flesh. And it's interesting here because Spurgeon's argument against baptismal regeneration is the fact that he said many people, when they're baptized, they don't actually believe. They have not actually repented of their sins before they're baptized. So it was not a pure baptism, and therefore baptismal regeneration is of null effect. But what I would like to argue is that Spurgeon arguing that is actually not getting anywhere with the matter. It's like saying that, uh, it, it, it's like arguing something saying, well, this is the right way to do it, but nobody does it right, and so therefore it's of none effect. That seems to be kind of the argument that he's getting there. But in reality, what Spurgeon should sell, tell people, he should say, yes, this is the biblical standard. This is the way that we are born again, but you must do it right, and we must take that first step. Because, the, because we can't just uh, pretend and find our own way to be born again. We have to do it according to the biblical standard. And so the, the, the main point I'm trying to get across there is that we must be baptized. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So the, the, of, it's of the utmost importance that when we are baptized, we must believe. Because if we don't believe, that baptism is of none effect. That's Mark, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And that's what it's talking about there. We must have that first step right, um, or else that baptismal regeneration will be of none effect. And that's, uh, in the Church of Christ, that is how we believe about that verse. We must believe. We must be thinking that Jesus really did die on the cross for our sins, and I'm going to be turning away from our sins. Because when those Pharisees and the Sadducees came to that baptism, they did not have meat for repentance. They did not want to be baptized and to move away from their sins. They wanted to do something that outwardly would look good to the people that John was, that John was baptizing. They wanted this to be a big public spectacle. Um, but when we are baptized, this does not need to be a big public spectacle. You could literally just say, um, go to your local church and say, hey, I would like to be baptized. And, and have them come down and have them baptize you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that could happen just like that. Verse 9, and think not to, okay, so we already read that verse. Verse 10, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Very straightforward here. Um, you must do those things that are right in the sight of the Lord, or you'll be cast into utter darkness. It's very straightforward. That is not my words. It's the words of the Bible. Um, if you think that is harsh, you think that the Bible is harsh. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he shall thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so I want to talk about a, a couple things here is that uh, it mentions that John the Baptist says he was just baptizing with water. He was just doing those, like I mentioned in John chapter 18, verse 36, that the Old Testament was just a shadow of the, of the real image. It was just a shadow of the more perfect vision and image of Christ. And so they were just doing the best they could. But it says, 
uh, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So for us today, when we are baptized, the Holy Ghost is also a part of that process. And, um, and also part of that process is fire. And so if you have the grain of a piece of wheat and it has the chaff around it, the fire will purge that chaff around it and it will purify us. And it will also purify those that are not doing the right things. And it will, and it will separate us that are doing the correct things. Okay. And so now I want to uh, spend a brief moment here. Um, oh, I want to take a, a brief moment here. John chapter 16, verse 7. I want to talk about water uh, versus the Holy Ghost baptism. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So water baptism is simply a shadow of the more perfect baptism brought by Jesus' death. And so Jesus is also saying... I'm going to die, and if, unless I die, unless I go away from you, um, so this way, if I die and go away, then the Holy Spirit may come. So when Jesus goes away, the Holy Spirit is now in more, has a more intimate relationship with our lives. And also the concept of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, this does not make it uh, not occur with water. Because we're actually given the example of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and they still use immersion baptism in the New Testament. It is still the example that we've been given. So it's still used with water, but when we are baptized, when we are immersed, and that's what that word means, it means immersed, then, then we can gain that Holy Spirit if we have not already gained it. Uh, and so, so here's some more. And the reason I said that uh, we'll gain it if we have not already gained it. Uh, for example, John the Baptist, it says that he, uh, that he had the Holy Spirit even in the womb. And so some people, baptism and Holy Spirit don't necessarily have to go together. I think many times they do, but that is not the only purpose of baptism. Baptism is being born again. It does not necessarily mean that is the exact moment that you're receiving the Holy Spirit. I think for the vast 99% of people, that is the case, um, but there is examples in the Bible where they are not perfectly tied to one another. Um, so let me do a couple ones. A couple. Uh, now I want to talk about the myths of baptism. And so one common myth is that uh, that you need to be baptized? That you can be baptized by yourself. And the example of, of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, they it says they went down both into the water. So this was uh, more than one person went to uh, went to go and be baptized. So it was. Um, I just heard one preacher online. He said that many of the baptisms were by yourself, and this is crazy to me because that there's no New Testament um, example of some being somebody being baptized in this manner. And by when I say there's no New Testament example, I'm talking about we're living in the New Testament. So if that is something that the Bible has condoned, this is the example we've been provided. We need to follow that example that they, that's been provided by them. Another myth is that there needs to be a bunch of, uh, of steps and hardships before you can be baptized. But it's interesting here because it, with the case of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian had just understood the significance and power of Jesus at the very moment before his baptism. And so that's the exact case there. And if you ever, if you want to look at this case that I'm talking about, it's Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39. Let's just go ahead and read it. Um, I keep referring to it, but if you haven't heard that story, let's just go ahead and read it. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, rejoicing. So we can see here a New Testament example with water, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is the exact example here. Um, it doesn't mention explicitly the Holy Spirit in this example, but I believe um, it is implicit within these verses. Um, another verse Baptism, um, some people argue that, or this is another myth, baptism is not immersion. And it says he came up out of the water. The word baptizo, a Greek word, it means immersion. And so we can't just pretend that baptism needs to be a sprinkling or a dripping. Uh, this will, uh, I can't imagine that will be of any effect because we are being buried in the likeness of his resurrection. We are not being sprinkled with dirt um, to, to represent the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We need to get completely into the water, and then we need to rise up out of that water. 
And how do we really rise up out of the water? How are, how, and, and I'm talking about um, symbolically. How do we really rise up out of the water? And how do we really um, have a perfect baptism? We need to have faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And we need to believe that uh, in, in that action. In Colossians 2 and, 12, 2 and 12 refers to, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it says that we are buried with him in baptism. We're also you're risen with him by faith in the operation of Christ. So who really did that action? God did the action. Yes, we went into the water, but that is simply an act of faith. We are, we are demonstrating our faith in the operation of Christ in the exact method that, uh, that we need to be born again with. So we know that it is through immersion, and we know that uh, we know that we do not need to go through a bunch of steps and hardships. The Ethiopian eunuch he just then understood, and then he was be and then he was baptized. We know that it is not by yourself. We do ha have not been given any examples of when it is by yourself, and we also know that it's in the New Testament. This is something that applies to us. This is not just an Old Testament concept. Um, and some other myths is that. That works don't save you, so baptism won't save you. So let me read a couple verses here. This is one of the most common arguments. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so it's interesting here because they, a lot of times that, that verse is quoted, but they forget about the second half of that verse that says, um, How are we saved? It says, By the washing of regeneration. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. Baptism does both those things. And that is, has to do with the washing of regeneration. And it has to do with the, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Um, Colossians 2 and 12 um, adds this. And that was what I referred to earlier. Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also you are risen with him. Through faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. And so we see that who really did the work. It was not us. This is not simply a work of righteousness. Uh, it says in Colossians 2 and 12, it specifically says operation of God. That is where it classifies baptism, an operation of God, a work of God. And in fact, there's even a story in the Bible, I can't remember the exact case, or I'm not going to be able to paraphrase it perfectly for you. But they said, how might we do the works of God? So they even asked them, there's, there's different kinds of works. Um, there's works of righteousness. And in fact, there's even a verse in Revelations that talks about even a different kind of works. It talks about, so we have works of God, works of righteousness. In Revelations, it even talks about how um, the book of life, and written in the book of life, will be an account of all the things that we've done in our life. And that in, in that sense, that is the works. We will be judged based off our works in the sense of how we've lived our life. And so there's many different kinds of works. Let's just not take any of those um, things out of context. So if somebody says we're not saved by works, say, um, well, we're not saved by works of righteousness. We're not saved by works of the law. We're not saved by um, various other works, but we are saved by the works of God. And we need to, and we need to um, act in the biblical example of being baptized to indicate this, to show our faith in the operation of God. And uh, another note is some people just say baptism, it's just a side note and it's not necessary for salvation. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus, when he appeared to them um, into the mountains of Galilee, when he came... Uh, after he died and was resurrected, he appeared to his disciples and he went out and one of the main things he wanted to order them to do, this is called the Great Commission, the Great Order, the Great Commandment to the people, to his disciples. Right after he died and was resurrected from the dead, he told his disciples, he said, I want you to go about and I want you to do these things. He says, um, go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And I'm with you always, even at the end of the world. So those are the main three things. This is not a side note. Baptism cannot just be dismissed in that sense. This is one of the main priorities that Jesus wanted to teach us, that Jesus commanded of us during the Great Commission, the Great Order, the Great Law, the Great Commandment to us. Um, and so another argument, we're just going to go through all these myths, is that some people gained the Holy Spirit without baptism, and therefore baptism is not beneficial. And one of my... Uh, Actually, one of my favorite YouTubers, his name is David Wood, and I've heard him, um, I think it's, uh, I can't remember his, his uh, YouTube channel, but he's 
really great guy. He's done um, absolutely fantastic things for spreading the the word the the name of Christ and and to teach people about him and to um, dismiss a lot of different myths about other religions. But in fact, this is what discourages him from thinking that baptism is critical for salvation. Um, he says that uh, since the Holy Spirit in this example is not perfectly tied to baptism, therefore baptism is of none effect. And let me dismiss this for you. Let me go through this very meticulously so that there's a, no question that baptism is so important. Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And so David Wood might tell you, look at that. These people just received the Holy Ghost and they were baptized. It was just poured out amongst them and they didn't even need it. And, but the problem is, I actually had a, I had a friend also uh, quote this to me, and, um, and he thought he got me. And at that moment, I wasn't very experienced in this, in this story. And so I just said, well, that's odd to me. I, I'm not used to that story. But what happened is we didn't keep reading. Anytime, somebody, anytime something seems contrary to your belief set, what you need to do is you need to read above that verse and below that verse as far as you can until you have fully identified the context. So let's reread that again. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? So these people, they've received the Holy Spirit. This is my words, by the way. Um, those people, they've received the Holy Spirit. And then Peter... He said, uh, he, he said to them, then answered Peter, can any man forbid water? That these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Another thing is that, uh, I'm trying to remember the preacher. He's, a, he's an Asian guy. Really, really, um, I, I, I like a lot, a lot of his lessons. Uh, Francis Chan. Francis Chan is actually somebody, a um, very, very popular preacher. He believes baptism for salvation. He's somebody that recognizes the utmost importance of baptism. And, uh, and he talks about the, the, the relationship between baptism and the Holy Spirit. And he does a really great job of that in one of his lessons. So this is not just a, a random um, out in the countryside idea. Some, some uh, mainstream Christians have recognized the truth as well. Um, Another one is uh, the myth that baptism doesn't save us. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The light figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we go into that water, we're not just putting away the filth of the flesh. We're not just wiping away a little bit of dirt. And that, that's not what's cleaning us. We don't get to just wash our hands of those things. Like Pilate, when he crucified Christ, he had that water up there and he decided he was going to wash his hands in front of the people. And he says, I'm absolving myself of this thing. I'm cleansing myself of this thing. I'm repenting of this thing and cleaning myself of this thing physically. But the problem is he was not cleansing of himself, cleansing himself of the spiritual sin that he had occurred, that he had uh, committed. Sorry. Okay. And then uh, for a little bit of bonus, if you're still not convinced, read Romans chapter six. And that will clarify everything and talk about how we are planted in the likeness of his resurrection. How we are being buried with him. And so that is why a sprinkling will not do. We must be immersion. We must be fully planted. But how do we rise? We must rise through faith. And that is, the, the, that is the, the, of the utmost importance. But what that also indicates to you, that rising, the faith portion, is the most important part. Because the fact that... If Christ comes again, and I've been baptized, and I had my life right, but I decided I'm just going to live the way I wanted to, and I'm going to reject Christ, and I'm going to fall away. There's many different verses about falling away, and I've decided to go my own way. And uh, that faith was required. And if I lost my faith, how can I rise? How can I rise? Um, some people like to tell you that uh, if that was the case, if I really did lose my faith, that I never really was born again. And I would like to, th I, I would like to argue that that is, um, absolute insanity to, to think that way. Um, another, one of the ideas behind that is that, um, th and this is, I recognize that anecdotal evidence is not the best evidence possible. Um, but I know of a person that was very, very close to God and, um, very, very, very close. And they were baptized and they loved God 
and they turned away. They, they completely rejected God. And if, and if God came today, um, I, don't, I don't think that they would be in a good state. And I'm not uh, condemning them. I'm not say, that is not my right as a human. I don't get to, to judge them in that sense. But what I can say is if they're not living right, how can they make it? Uh, if the Bible says if you're living in this way and those people don't make it, I won't have the final say. I'm not going to judge them in that sense. But I will tell them, turn from your ways, come back to Christ. Verse 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And you might be thinking, what, what's Jesus doing? Why is he coming to be baptized for, the, for repentance when he hasn't even sinned? But the fact is that Jesus wanted to be this perfect example for us. He was willing to humble himself and take on this human flesh and, uh, and, and to live out the hardships of a human when he's a god. And... Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so beautiful to me that Jesus was willing to become a human um, and to take on that fleshly role and to still live a perfect life, to still live a perfect example. And he said, I'm going to, to show the people that this is the correct act to do, even though I have no sin to, to be cleansed of. And he even says later, he says, I do this to fulfill all righteousness. Um, verse 14, but John forbade him saying, I need to be baptized of thee and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be, uh, to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So Jesus had to do it. He had to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. That is the exact reason that the Bible gives us here. There's not, no, uh, no more or no less to be said about that verse. Verse 15, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill... Okay, so I read that, sorry. Um, verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so this is the most beautiful interaction of the Trinity. If anybody needs any help identifying the three parts of the Trinity, show them this. Say, flip with me to Matthew chapter 3 and verses... Uh, Verses 16 and 17, right at the end of Matthew chapter 3, it shows the beautiful example. Jesus, it says, so clearly he was immersed because he came up straightway out of the water. If he was just sprinkled, he couldn't have came up, up out of the water. So Jesus came up out of the water. And it says, the heavens opened, and God the Father from above said, uh, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. We can see all three parts. Jesus coming up out of the water. There's one. The Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And you can see that reckon that uh, the relationship between Holy Spirit and baptism right there as well. So we can see the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and then God the Father from above. That's that third piece of the Trinity. Saying, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. If anybody has any difficulties with the Trinity, it is a perfect and beautiful example. And so that is it for the lesson on... Um, on the upside down kingdom. And if there's one verse I want you to take away with from uh, today is that, uh, or two concepts is John 18 and 36, a wonderful verse to memorize is that, uh, uh, actually, sorry, um, James chapter four, verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and you will get, um, uh, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And so that's, that's the lesson I have for you today. I hope that it's helpful for you and, uh, and God bless.